PM considers next option to challenge the opposition. PA demands for salary increments continues. And nominations for by-election in Bougainville closed. This is National MTV News with Shemaine Poriambe. Good evening and thanks for joining us for National MTV News. The government is considering either a slip rule application or a Supreme Court interpretation on Section 19 of the Constitution. Lawyers representing the Prime Minister, the Speaker and the Attorney General are going through documents and considering the next best court action. This was mentioned by Prime Minister James Marape during the FM 100's talkback show this morning. Following the decision of the Supreme Court on Wednesday, the government and the Speaker of Parliament and the Attorney General are now considering their options to challenge the decision. The Supreme Court declared the recalling of Parliament on 17th of November by the Speaker illegal. This also means all other government businesses that transpired on that day, including the passing of the 2021 budget, are now void. One thing our constitution clearly defines is the separation of the roles and responsibility of the three arms of government, clearly. Doctrine of separation of powers. Correct. And uh, parliamentary procedures uh, is non-justiciable. And court, uh, whilst court has every, uh, in my view, right to uh, direct as they see fit, yes. but uh, there are certain areas where court has limitations. Mm. Our lawyers are looking into any possibility of, uh, uh, not just necessarily for this exercise in, the, in the, the politics that is at play, but just for the general principle of it. Yes, yes. And uh, for, for good measure, if uh, judgments made uh, by court has an area where we feel we need to sign further light into, in as far as areas of law we feel and our lawyers feel are uh, 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 grey, then it is within our entitlement and our right to uh, also uh, go to court to seek that redress. The Prime Minister says their lawyers are considering either a slip rule application or a Section 19 reference of the Constitution. A slip rule application is when a party, in this case the government, asked the court to revisit its decision to correct any accidental slips or omissions in the judgment or orders. Meanwhile, Section 19 of the Constitution is about special references to the Supreme Court. So lawyers is looking into that possibility of slip rule uh, application mm -hmm. or a possibility of section 19 reference but uh, uh, our AG and, and the speaker uh, is also looking into this matter but uh, as I said we all set program program set for Monday uh, this matter is different matter the legal track is different matter with or without the Monday deadline uh, as uh, instructed by court uh, uh, politics will play its own course and our legal matters will play its own course. The Prime Minister was speaking at FM 100's talkback show this morning. Also during the talkback show, the Prime Minister said the 2021 budget is a priority as the court ordered Parliament sitting convinced on Monday next week. He said the Treasurer will be looking at the earliest opportunity to table the budget again. On Wednesday, the Supreme Court ordered that the 17th of November Parliament sitting is illegal. Automatically, the 2021 budget is also illegal. Prime Minister James Marape said the budget is the most important government document and the Treasurer and the government will look for every opportunity that arises on Monday when Parliament sits. With the full sitting expected on Monday, this time the government will need numbers to pass the budget. The Treasurer and our government will look for every opportunity. First opportunity arrives on uh, Monday. And, uh, you know, the government business is important. Budget is the most important one. Exactly. So we're looking forward to go to Parliament and uh, you know, lobby the conscience of our colleagues in Crown that uh, the country is far important. The country is far important than any one person who aspires to be Prime Minister. Opposition leader Belden Nama and member for Yalibu Pangia Peter O'Neill have further called on the Prime Minister to resign following the Supreme Court's decision. But James Marape won't waver. Uh, James Marape is not resigning. Uh, you wanted the vote of no confidence process. Initiate the vote of no confidence. Name your alternate prime minister. Uh, put it on the put it on the uh, paper correct. Run it through the correct parliament process, and uh, let's have a fair play in parliament. I got by vote in parliament, and I will go down by vote in parliament. 
Meanwhile, the Prime Minister said he believes in changing the status quo and if it means he loses trying to change the status quo, he will. He said taking back PNG is about taking back all the resources, ensuring the formula for wealth distribution is fair for all. You can come into government, but if you don't change the formula of getting more for our country, mm. you will still be going borrowing on borrowing on into the future. Uh, and so someone's got to have the guts somewhere to say, hang on. Uh, we just have to change the formula in which our resource harvest and benefit distribution has been taking place. The Prime Minister was speaking at the closing of the FM100 Talkback Show for 2020. Executives of the Public Employees Association in Papua New Guinea have expressed that the union remains neutral in light of the current political impasse. In a media conference this afternoon, the union leaders continued to demand the government for action upon their long-standing claims regarding salary fixation agreements and CPI adjustments for public servants in the country. The association executives also responded to a statement released by the Department of Personal Management regarding their claims recently. Public servants in the country have missed out on CPI adjustments for two years consecutive and with just two weeks remaining before Christmas, the union leaders hope the government provides some indication of action for their outstanding claims. So we as an independent body, we are asking whichever government that we missed out 2020. We don't want to miss out 2021. Now, the Supreme Court has ruled that the budget is unconstitutional. Whichever that government comes, <coughs> happens to be the government of the day, still our petition must go through. If there's a adjustments to the budget, which has been called unconstitutional, if there's any adjustments, we will demand that DPM provides a budget for the public servants to meet salary fixation in the public service. And with the Supreme Court recalling Parliament next Monday, meaning the passing of the 2021 national budget in November was unconstitutional, PEA hopes their claims will be considered before the year ends. There were two things that we were asking from the state. One was to support the pay packet with the uh, salary fiction agreement of 7.5%, 6% goes towards the current CPI movement. CPI has gone over 6% right now. So 6% will be base salary adjustment. It's not an increment. 1.5 is the productivity for the public service. That brings it to 7.5%. That's in the hands of government right now. Number two is a insurance cover for all our public servants. Whilst both sides of parliament have their plans on the best way forward for PNG's economy, PEA leaders say the union body wishes to remain neutral. However, they say the petition to government presented last month needs to be addressed, and the union leaders say failure to do so will result in public servants taking industrial action. Uh, we are not in support of whichever comes in. Uh, we haven't had any dialogues with the government or with the opposition. Let them be Hollywood stars, but first they must think of the people. PEA executives say because the Department of Personnel Management has failed to address their claims over two years, they are now petitioning the government to act upon their claims for the welfare of public servants. The DPM statement released last month by Secretary Tyus Sanson stated that this is a negotiation process made more difficult by the prevailing economic situation and the COVID-19 pandemic, and so PEA should not go to the media. PEA executives slammed this statement, describing it as nonsense, as the process has taken two years and that this has become a public concern. Uh, what process is DPM talking about? They've already left the process. And they want to tie the union hand by not going to media and all this. No, this is a public policy matter. Information should go to the public, not to be kept in house. It's for public consumption right now. For the people of the country to know what public servants are going through right now.
and they tell me to shut up. They tell the union to be gagged. Denny Sorere, National MTV News. Nominations for the by-election of the Bougainville Regional Seat is now closed with five nominations received from the Bougainville Electoral Commission. Provincial Returning Officer Alvin Jimmy said with the nomination period ending, the Electoral Commission is now preparing for six weeks of awareness program before the one-day polling. Of the five nominations for the Bougainville regional seat, one is a woman, showing yet again Bougainville's diversity in politics. Except that the uh, five candidates now who are going to contest the seat, and I have all my officers here, the returning officers for the North, North Bougainville, South, and we still yet to have uh, our central guy to come. But otherwise, out of these five, we have one lady contested the seat as well. And uh, we look forward to conduct the elections uh, on the 20th of uh, January. The Electoral Commission now preparing for awareness on the one-day polling set to take place on the 20th of January. This will be the first of its kind for the region. Uh, candidates go out for their campaign. We are going out. The Electoral Commission will go out to educate the people because this will be the first of its kind to conduct a one-day poll in Bougainville. And we want the people of Bougainville to prepare themselves so that you know we cover the whole province uh, in that one day. That's the reasons why we have increased the polling teams to 410 to cover with the total of about uh, 3,000 plus officials to carry out this particular, I mean, this particular by-election that is coming up. During polling, the Bougainville Electoral Commission will have designated lines for men, women and people with special needs. But we are here to make sure that the people must uh, know that we are going to conduct a transparent elections for them. And that's a big thing. And I want the people of Bougainville to make sure that they... Uh, I mean, they are peace-loving people and I know that they will uh, cooperate with us to conduct these elections. Adelaide Sirox Curry National, MTV News. The Joint Supervisory Body meeting between the Autonomous Bougainville Government and Marape Government has been put on hold due to the current political standoff. However, ABG President Ishmael Torama is remaining steadfast on his commitment for political independence from PNG. He is adamant that the consultation period will lead to independence and so is the need to grow the Bougainville economy. President Ishmael Torama was speaking at the launch of Bana Special Economic Zone in the Baba constituency, South Bougainville. Torama committing to political independence for Arab. Long make him so. Political independence belongs to me through long consultation. Me play must achieve him. Me play stand up strong through long all. Consultative meetings, one time, government of Papua New Guinea. Toro Ama clearly speaking with passion when he mentions those who had lost their lives for Arab to gain independence. Blong all founding fathers, blong yumi. Stand up. Blong all people, blong yumi, who start only stand up. Now only fight, long independence, now only die. His speech comes at a time an important initial JSP meeting post-referendum has been put on hold due to the current political challenge taking place here in Port Moresby. Tarama encouraging his people to not lose sight. Generations that you may walk long stand up. Let us create a workaholic society. Time you may vote long 98%. You indirectly release him. Get by you. He come in Ceylon government so that we, in partners, we can work together. The autonomous region is currently pushing to have at least some form of economic independence, with the PNG government supporting it with 20 million kina for MSME and SME growth. Marpe government also committing to giving financial, budgetary and foreign affairs powers to ABG to allow them to grow their economy. President Torama reminding his people what it meant when they voted in favor of independence. 
Kampai Airport Security Guarantee me give him today me like assure him you your land will not be taken away from you but that law will represent you because it is your original identity that will portray your rights and image that you are a Bougainvillian. So stand up me, me stand up here, now me stand up from all principles, from all founding fathers from me, now stand up from all principles, from revolutionary founding fathers, now today me stand up as president, long me I swear to you, we will work together. Adelaide Zorks Kari National, MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We'll have more of the day's stories after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. The displaced settlers residing at Leigh's State House have taken the Morabe Provincial Government to court on the grounds of human rights. They have been living at the State House for almost five years now, following an ethnic clash at their home at Boundary Road suburb. A spokesperson said the Provincial Government has delayed proper plans for their resettlement, resulting in a rise in health and overcrowding issues for the settlers. The settlers living at the Lay State House have taken the Morabe provincial government to court on grounds of human rights. This comes after years of waiting in vain for a proper resettlement exercise. Spokesperson Oga Munelli said the decision to take the matter to court is the last resort for a proper resettlement exercise. So now I'm um, uh, look at This now gonna help him. I'm look clear to Maslow. Think think blah blah. Through long government. That's why now me play fight him the rights me play through the court. Me play play me play and get him uh, uh, lawyer blah blah. Any law human rights law. Now me play register him the case. Now me play now fight him the case. The settlers signed an MOU with the MPG in 2017 for their resettlement. However, Nelly claims only nine families were resettled under that MOU. Those who were left out have remained here to date. Government uh, name delay him this plan. You know, so maybe blow me at me when the government is failing me, blow uh, peace process. You go now, every boom you mean, I'm not going to stop the law. I'm not going to stop the law. I'm not going to stop the law. Meanwhile, the issue with settlers residing at the state house is accompanied by the deteriorated state that this provincial government property is in. This residence, which is supposed to be occupied by the Morabe governor, has become a case center for over 100 settlers who have waited on the Morabe provincial government for years to be properly resettled. The governor's office has responded, saying one million kina has been made available for resettlement plans this year, and funds for the upgrade of the state house will be made available next year. Charlene Airy, National MTV News, Lay. A high school in Morabes Nawai district that was denied operations for 17 years celebrated its first graduation yesterday. Boana Lutheran High School was established in 2002. However, formal classes began in 2019. The high school graduated over 100 grade 10 students. These grade 10 graduates were the first grade 9 students to enroll at the Boana Lutheran High School in Nawai District last year. The school is a boarding institute and accommodates students from Nawai and other districts in Morobe, including Makam and Yuen Gulf. A parent of one of the graduates said they have been waiting for almost 17 years to see their children graduate with a high school certificate. <laughs> Buana Lutheran High School was established in 2002 in Nawai District, Morobe. The school's operation was delayed for almost 17 years due to incomplete building constructions by several contractors hired by the provincial government and the district development authority under the previous government. In 2018, Nawai DDA, headed by Chairman and MP Kennedy Wenge, completed the infrastructure. Formal classes for the grade nines officially began last year. Incomplete project law, 
high school of honor. Mess two and was missing. Also present at the ceremony yesterday was Vice Minister for National Planning, Dr. Kobe Bomario, and Minister for Lands and Caretaker Minister for Education, John Rosso. Rosso allocated 300,000 kina to the school, to the Education Department to build a new science lab. Most of us are trying to do electoral work, but uh, this uh, latest uh, political episode is not helping. We're trying our best to uh, be with our people, but uh, as you can see, no one is locked up on our camp. Uh, I don't know about the other side, but uh, for the government side, we're allowed to move around freely. Julie Badui, OA, National MTV News. The board of Nawai Lutheran High School called on Morabe Education Division and the Education Department to change the school status to secondary. The school board said most of their students' learning are being distracted when selected to secondary schools in Lay. Nawai District Development Authority also supported the school board's decision. After officiating the first graduation ceremony of Buana Lutheran High School in Nawai's Wine Arab LLG, a delegate of the government traveled to Hobu Nabak LLG to witness Nawai Lutheran High School's graduation. During the ceremony yesterday, the school board said they are in consultation with the education division and the education department to change the status of the school to secondary. Nawai DDA supported the idea and said the secondary school will benefit grade 10 students from the two high schools in the district. Every start come tomorrow, all by go away because Bumayong, he got sick. Okay. I mean, I mean, plan to pick in the now. One can go Bumayong. But when you do a speech, pull up, I said, wait, that question, like it or not? Great, 11. Nawai Lutheran High School has a boarding facility with over 300 students. The school was established in 2004 and witnessed its 16th graduation ceremony yesterday. Infrastructure including teachers' houses has been a problem for the school. The caretaker Minister for Education John Rosso, after addressing the graduates, committed a 300,000 kina to the school to build teachers' houses. Just seeing the infrastructure and stuff, it really needs a lot of uh, attention. So in my capacity as the acting caretaker education minister, I've committed to build a uh, science lab for the uh, Buona High School. And uh, that's a commitment of 300,000, which uh, uh, we will uh, commit and uh, give to Buona. And we've made the same commitment here in Bobo, which is a, a good school, but it needs a lot of infrastructure uh, assistance. And we've committed 300,000 for uh, assisting them in building teachers' houses so the teachers can uh, live and work here at Bobo. Construction is currently underway for a four-in-one classroom that is funded by the Nawai DDA. Julie Badui, OA, National MTV News. It's been four years since the Barin Gigil High School was established in Kundiawa Gambok district of Chimbu province. Despite a challenging year, the school graduated 79 grade 10 students from an enrollment of over 250 students at the beginning of 2020. Head teacher Rosalind Tony called this the survival of the fittest. Like most schools this year, the high school was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and also faced challenges with infrastructure development. Despite all this, the school hosted their fourth graduation on Wednesday, well attended by families, friends and invited guests. Keynote speaker and managing director of TNA Holdings, Gerard Phillip, encouraged students to set goals and achieve their dreams and aspirations. The graduation was supported by the community and guests who sponsored the top academic awards. And now looking at the Nest Fund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, the Kina is buying 0.2775 US dollars, 0.3638 Australian dollars, 0.2202 Euro and 28.26 Japanese Yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher, coffee closed higher, cocoa closed higher and copper closed higher. Rather lower, crude oil is trading higher, palm oil closed higher and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed lower, the AS 
SPXX200 is trading lower and the All Ordinaries is trading lower. Among stories making headlines overseas, the United States is a step closer to approving a coronavirus vaccine. Stay with us for the details. Welcome back to the news. Turning abroad, a Kiwi who says was sexually assaulted by a foreign diplomat is devastated. The man won't be brought back to face consequences. Police announced last week they won't seek extradition for the Korean diplomat, despite the fact the charges he's facing could see him jail for seven years. Three years have passed since this Kiwi was allegedly the victim of three sexual assaults. I just tried to block everything out. It took him 18 months to find the courage to come forward. Today he feels that bravery has all been for naught. I was devastated. It's like, I was confused. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. This week he was told police wouldn't seek extradition for Korean diplomat Hong Kong Kim. He faces three charges of indecent assault for groping the victim at the Wellington Embassy. Police say there was enough to charge him, but not enough to extradite him back to New Zealand. What do you make of that suggestion, that there's enough evidence to prosecute, but not for extradition? Well, there is enough for extradition. So I think the police are just lying to me. Extradition law expert Grant Illingworth QC says New Zealand's treaty with Korea is clear. The conduct must be punishable in both countries uh, for not less than 12 months imprisonment. The charges Kim faces could bring him seven years in prison. And News Hub sought advice from a Korean law expert who says if the allegations were proven, they equate to a crime in Korea as well. If the New Zealand police are saying that the uh, threshold for extradition has not been met, uh, then they should be explaining why that is. The trouble is, police won't do that, and neither will the minister in charge. Does the victim not deserve an explanation? Oh, look, as I say, my heart goes out to the victim. It's always very difficult in these cases to step forward. If it was someone that had stolen a car, I could understand not extraditing. But this is sexual assault. It carries a seven-year prison sentence. There's enough evidence for prosecution. Uh, the guy should be brought back here to face trial. The only explanation police would give came in the form of a statement saying that on top of the evidence, decisions are based on the accused's location and the cost of bringing them here. The victim asked police not to go public, they did it anyway. Why do you think they did that? They want this to go away. The pain is going nowhere for this Kiwi complainant, but paths towards justice are fading away. The Australian state of Queensland is opening its borders to Kiwis from tomorrow and New Zealanders don't have to quarantine for two weeks once they get there. Dust off your passport. The picture-perfect sandy beaches across the ditch are back in business. And New Zealanders from 1am tomorrow morning are welcome to come to Queensland. So that's excellent news, especially in the lead-up to uh, Christmas and the holidays. More than 200,000 Kiwis already live in the Sunshine State, with the Gold Coast, Noosa, Cairns and Brisbane some of our favourite holiday spots. Typically Australia counts for 50% of the outbound travel, and out of that the vast majority go to Queensland. But if it's just a sunny holiday you're after, expect to pay for the privilege. You'll still need to come to a quarantine hotel like this one on your return, adding thousands to your trip. There is money around and people will be prepared to do that, especially if they're going over to family. Travellers, though, seem wary of rushing over. No, no, I just think I'll sit and wait for a wee bit longer. Uh, probably a bit soon. I love New Zealand and I'd rather put money into New Zealand tourism. I don't think people really have time to take an extra two weeks off. It means New Zealanders can now travel to all states without going into managed isolation, except for Western Australia. So everybody, how are you? But a trans-Tasman bubble holds the key to a booking boom. They want to get over there to see their family and friends. Christmas is an ideal time, but of course at the moment, until those borders are open for free travel back into New Zealand, there is going to limit that demand. It's very safe for New Zealanders to go to Australia now, as it is for New Zealanders to go to some islands in the Pacific. Uh, some of these, some of the states in Australia have had no disease transmission for many months, actually longer than New Zealand. So why is it taking so long? 
I know people want to restart that travel, but we want to do it safely. I don't want to take any risks that jeopardise the freedoms we have. With more freedom to travel promised in the near future. The United States is one step away from approving a coronavirus vaccine for general use. And the country is facing a tidal wave of cases with the death toll reaching 3,000 a day. It's the news America's doctors have been waiting to hear. Personally, I cannot roll up my sleeve fast enough to get this vaccination. The Federal Drug Administration's advisory board recommending the vaccine be approved after experts deliberated all day. We do have a favorable vote and that concludes this portion of the meeting. We can act quickly and we uh, intend to. We understand the urgency of the situation. This week, the U.S. reached a number many dreaded was coming. More than 3,000 deaths in a single day. For how many continuous days have you been pulling 20-hour days? I can't even think, but it's probably about 12 to 14 days, somewhere in there. They've been preparing for this. 2.9 million doses boxed up, ready to go within 24 hours of the final OK. U.S. Marshals will be assisting the operation. Health professionals are standing by. That could include walker clinics. It could include driver clinics. We're evaluating all the models right now. America's biggest hurdle isn't the approval of a vaccine or even the logistics of rolling it out. It's how long it will take to have an effect. So many people are sick. So many more are infected that even a vaccine more than 90% effective will take a long time to get a hold in the general population. The World Health organization stunned at the situation the U.S. is facing. It's quite frankly yeah, shocking you know, to, to see one to two uh, persons a minute die uh, in the U.S., a, a country with a wonderful, uh, strong health system. The president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, and celebrity talk show host Ellen, the latest to become infected. They're both home, but more than 100,000 Americans are hospitalized. Love my family. We really want to treat this vaccine as the liquid gold that it is because it's, it's really the only tool that we have right now in our toolbox. Every tool needed with the country still facing the pandemic's full force. We break now for Trukai Sports. Here's Kilawani with the details. Thank you, Charmaine. Three former elite athletes get inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame and an update from the Women's Soccer League. Those stories in Trukai Sports when we come back. Tukai Sports. Good evening and welcome to Tukai Sports. 1991 Pacific Games gold medalist and PNG's record holder in the 100 and 200 men's events has been inducted in the Sports Hall of Fame. He is among three recipients of the awards presented by the PNG Olympics Committee last night. The other two are 1978 Pacific Games gold medalist and former sprinter Wawala Kali and the late Robert Stewart from the Code of Shooting. The 6th Papua New Guinea Olympics Committee Sports Hall of Fame inductions was held yesterday at the Port Mosby Arts Theatre in the nation's capital, in which three elite names in sports have been immortalised. From athletics, Takale Tuna, former elite sprinter who was the gold medalist in the 200 meters, 400 meters and silver medalist in the 100, the 4x400 meter relay and bronze in the 4x100 meter relay events of the 1987 Pacific Games in Noumea, New Caledonia. Another highlight was taking gold in the 200 meters, the 4x100 meter relay, 4x400 meter relay and taking silver in the 100 and 400 meter events during the 1991 Pacific Games in Port Moresby. Takala's first Pacific Games representation saw him achieve both national and Pacific Games records in the 1985 mini Pacific Games in Rarotonga, Cook Islands. You know, I, I broke all the national and Pacific Games record. I think I'm about the only Papua New Guinean who's got a, who's won the sprint travel, 100 to 100, 400. You know, you have the expectations of the country and soldiers, so uh, everybody expects you, especially when you've done so well over the years, you know, as you 
as the saying goes, when you reach the top, it's much, much harder to stay up there. The second inductee, also from the Court of Athletics, another sprint sensation, Wawala Kali. Wawala was ranked number one in three sprint events in the 1973 Australian Athletics Championships. He is the first gold medalist in the 400 meter event in a record time of 48.91 seconds in the 1975 Pacific Games in Guam and silver medalist in the 4x100 meter relay event. It was one of the proudest moments in my life because one of the things I was aiming to achieve, I achieved it at that time and so I was really happy with myself and uh, I was happy that I uh, made PNG proud. Wawala is the first PNG flag bearer when the team PNG competed in its first Olympic Games in Montreal, Canada in 1976. The third inductee is late Robert Stewart from the Code of Shooting. He is the first ever silver medalist in the full bore rifle event at the British Empire and Commonwealth Games in 1966, Kingston, Jamaica. He also represented Team PNG in 1974 to the 10th British Empire and Commonwealth Games, receiving on behalf of the late Robert, President of Palm Shooting Club, Mel Donalds. Papua New Guinea Olympics Committee President Sir John Dawanikura stated the recognition of these elite achievers in the sporting arena are an inspiration to a growing nation as Papua New Guinea. These are great men and women who have represented Papua New Guinea, obviously. And uh, we are here to just recognize their achievements. Adding their legacies will live on as they earned their place in history. They are pioneers of sports in whose remarkable achievements should not be lost or forgotten. I can proudly say that their legacies live on with the crop of uh, athletes that uh, we have uh, uh, representing Papua New Guinea. Minister for Sports Wesley Raminai applauded the three inductees. You have been wonderful ambassadors for our country throughout your sport and the country appreciates your contribution and the sacrifices that you have made. Adding sports has given individuals to become icons and heroes in their respects and in doing placed Papua New Guinea on the world map. Sport has provided many Papua New Guineans the opportunity to develop themselves and showcase their talents and allow the world to notice Papua New Guinea. And round two of the Women's National Soccer League is set for this weekend in Port Mosby and Leigh. The competition is aimed at strengthening domination of the national side in the Pacific region. It is also a pathway to scout talents in women's soccer. The Women's National Soccer League heads into its second round of matches this weekend. <laughs> as the country's top female players take to the field. With the dominance of PNG's women's soccer team at the Pacific Games, it is only fitting that the PNG Football Association establish a national women's competition. We have given precedence to women's football since um, uh, they've been the queens of Pacific. They've won five uh, consecutive gold medals, so um, it is now our duty um, to make sure that such competitions are always in existence for women in PNG. Um, this is the revival of the uh, National Soccer League. We look forward to keep it as an annual, uh, annual event. The competitions department will also be looking at uh, reviving competitions at the different levels, from schools football to youth and on to the senior level. In other words, uh, we will be creating that pathway for a young 12-year-old to reach the senior level. The WNSL is played in a league format across two conferences. The Northern Conference, made up of eight teams, play their matches at the St. Ignatius Kilage Stadium in Ley while the PNG Football Stadium in Port Mosby plays host to the six teams in the Southern Conference. The two top teams from each conference will proceed to the finals. The preparations leading up to the start was very, very good. Uh, the competitions department has uh, made it a must to uh, keep all clubs well informed, uh, starting from um, the expression of interest, the registration, and um, up to the first matches last weekend. So um, because of the, the good dialogue being placed between the clubs and the competitions department, we did not face any issues last weekend. The big thing was that um, um, the schedule started right on time in the Northern Conference. Uh, the first game kicked off at 9 o'clock sharp and Southern Region at 11 o'clock sharp. So uh, starting right on time, it indicates that uh, we're on the right track. 
both uh, the clubs and also the competition side. Axtilovai, Chukai Sports. And Chukai Sports continues with headlines from abroad after the break. Stay with us. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. New Zealand rugby has revealed the All Blacks tentative test matches for 2021. One news with more. The All Blacks are set to host Italy and Fiji in July before a hopeful return to a cross-border rugby championship. They'll then play Italy again as well as Ireland and France on their end-of-year tour, but NZR is looking to include one or two other matches as well. We're looking at games on either shoulder of that, of that fixture list in November or potentially um, two games before our first game in Europe against Italy. So, um, and, and there are a whole number of interested parties. All test them. matches remain subject to travel and border restrictions. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports. Shaman will be back with the weather report. Bye for now. Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. Weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. In the southern region, Port Moresby mostly fine, apart from a shower or two. Daru Kerama and Alotau mostly fine, partly cloudy. And Popondeta shower or two tonight, then fine cloudy morning. In the Mamasa region, lay a few showers tonight, then fine partly cloudy tomorrow. Medang rain showers drizzles tonight and fine cloudy tomorrow. We work a few showers and partly cloudy. Vanimo rain showers drizzles, then fine partly cloudy. In the New Guinea Islands, Loringau, Kavian, Kokopo, Rabal and Kimbe, thundery rain showers tonight, then fine partly cloudy. Buka, a few thundery showers tonight, then fine partly cloudy morning. And finally, the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, light showers, drizzles tonight, then morning fog. Oroka and Kundiawa, partly cloudy with a chance of a shower or two and morning fog. And finally, Mendy and Wabeg, fine, partly cloudy tonight and morning fog. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always. And that's the new sports and weather for Friday 11th of December 2020 as we count down to Christmas. Pleasant viewing. Good night.